Digest Broadcaster Chat. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, joined by Mick Gillespie and Kevin Reichard. Mick, first, how are you? Hey, doing great. You know, got my morning run in here in Fairhope. No baseball, that's bad, but you know what? At least I'm uh, somewhere I've always wanted to hang out and uh, still working on my book to Chapter 12 right now. So feeling pretty good about that. Chapter 12 out of how many? I don't know. I haven't gotten there yet. So as we, you know, the, the, the uh, outline has me going into the 20s. So we'll see how it turns out. But it, it's, it's been uh, fun writing. Well, Mick is proceeding forward. Kevin Reichardt, let's check in with you. As so many other aspects of the game try to also move forward, what are you hearing? Uh, I'm hearing what everyone else is hearing, that the two sides in the Major League Baseball MLBPA dispute are, are still apart. Although, interestingly enough, the latest proposal from Major League Baseball did not did not meet with a rancorous response from the Players Association. What, what Major League Baseball proposed was uh, a 74-game season with 16 playoff teams, which, you know, you might as well have every, might as well go NHL and have everyone involved, huh? And uh, had, a, had a typical short season beginning. Uh, the, the end date was important. They still want to stick to September 27th with October playoffs. And right. I, think that, I think that's very important. Uh, and something the players don't want to see. But I think it's very important because let's say things get normal this fall or, or relatively normal in terms of broadcasting. There's going to be a boatload of competition for baseball on the broadcasting front. You're going to be in full-blown NFL and college football seasons. You will be in, in uh, horse racing season, which, you know, commandeers, you know, the, the Triple Crown gets quite the high ratings. You're going to be uh, potentially in, uh, in uh, other seasons as well. And so I, I think there's a real danger in baseball playing playoffs into Thanksgiving and, and maybe even early December. I mean, the, the, the MLB warns you're going to lose some games in, in late September uh, anyway, but going in October is just suicide. And we will see how the players formally respond I mean, everything was lukewarm. Sean Doolittle went on Twitter, obviously, to say we want to play. Um, my gut still says we're going to end up with a season that ends September 27th or so in October playoffs. The thing of it has been that the summer, you don't have that competition. And yet as these negotiations have gone on, and I've seen some accusations levied that from one side that the negotiations have not been serious. And I've seen that, hey, the owners are running out the clock a little bit. Uh, there is, there is that chance right now, or as soon as possible. We're not going to have baseball by the 4th of July. I think that's a big danger. I think that if you want to give players three weeks to get into shape, you got to get your stuff in gear yesterday, basically. I mean, I think the June 1st deadline everyone was sort of looking toward was, was a very valid one. So I think it's a really good chance we will not see baseball on the 4th of July. Um, I think there's also... The, the fallback that MLB has is, is the 50-game season that both sides agreed to way back in March. And I'm not quite so sure the players are, are not regretting that a little bit now because that's a fully signed agreement, you know, duly, duly signed between both sides to give the commissioner power to impose a shorter season at full salaries. Let me ask you about ballpark debt, which you wrote about for Ballpark Digest. There's a lot of thought about what are all the other dominoes that are going to fall down the line that we don't even realize right now? And you've got your eyes to the future. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of issues with uh, how ballparks have been financed the last decade. Um, you know, in the article on the site, it outlines the fact that uh, the debt on City Field has been downgraded to junk, junk status. Uh, even though S&P did say there's a, it's highly unlikely it won't be repaid. But junk status is not, not good when you're trying to sell the team. And uh, Yankee Stadium is, isn't there yet. Um, but in a lot of cities, you're seeing, for instance, let's look at Minneapolis and how Target Field was uh, financed. The bonding there was backed not by the team, but by a, a countywide sales tax. And so the, the problems that are affecting Major League Baseball 
may not be directly translatable to the target field debt. The trouble is in a recession is no one's spending money. So all of a sudden that sales tax spigot is sort of turned down and, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's much concern about it in, in uh, the, the Minneapolis ballpark authority so far, because they've actually been ahead of schedule in paying off the bonds, but they're not the only, only city to, to have issues with, with bonding. Uh, in a lot of minor league cities, it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. Uh, most of these ballparks were financed with, with, with some level of bonding backed by specific streams of income. Those streams of income dry up and all of a sudden you've got issues. And then there's the whole problem, which I write about next week, is privately financed ballparks, no income. How do they repay their debt? And there's, there's teams out there with quite a bit of debt on the ballpark side. So all the businesses that we've seen shut down, the restaurants, the local things, this is just the start of us understanding the true damage that is being done. There's going to be a lot of ripple effect from this. It's going to affect existing ballpark debt. It's going to uh, uh, impact any future ballpark construction and how, the, how that uh, construction is funded. And, you know, I, after, after I wrote that piece uh, for yesterday's newsletter, I did hear from like, like 10 or so owners, you know, saying, yeah, we know it's coming up. We're, we're a little scared about it. So we'll see what happens. We've got the Major League Baseball draft coming up in the next couple of days. Uh, we've got, in addition to the baseball that we want to see get started at the Major League level, there's summer wooden bat leagues that are very much planning to get going. I believe that there are still some independent leagues that are planning to hold their, their season. Am I, am I incorrect in saying that? No, the Atlantic League is calling players back. Uh, they, had a, they had a workout, Somerset had a workout the other day for, for local players. They're not really calling them back as more local players and, and wannabes working out at this time. Um, the American Association has been a little quiet uh, after initially saying, well, we, we plan on a season. But, but there's not been – a few teams in that circuit have been signing players, not all have. Uh, the Frontier League is saying, we don't know when we're coming back. They issued a statement the other day that said, well, we're just waiting to see what happens. Uh, the Woodbat Leagues, most have closed down. You're down to the Coastal Plain League. You're down to the Northwoods League, which has a pod of teams launching next week in Bismarck. So three teams playing out of Bismarck, Bismarck Municipal Stadium. Um, tomorrow, I believe there is a call among Northwood League owners and the league office to sort of map out the next strategy. But the, you know, when you got a huge footprint and you've got to please officials in you know, so many states, in Wisconsin here, in Fond du Lac they can play, in Green Bay they can play, in Dane County they can't play. So you can't even go by statewide. You have to look at the, the counties within the states to determine who's ready to play and who's ready to move. This is something that I'm interested in following. Because with the draft, only five rounds, and then the maximum of $20,000 paid to free agents, it would seem to me that there are a lot of seniors out there who won't get drafted and maybe won't get that call to sign. So they'd want to find anywhere where they could play where a team could notice them. And then you would have wooden bats or independent league or whatever it might be. There would be players just wanting to play wherever they could find a field, wherever they could find any kind of competition, just trying to attract scouts' eyes. I think you're going to see more than, more than a few players end up signing uh, overseas. If I were them, and I know a few agents are pushing this, I'd go play in Japan, in a Japan minor league. I'd go to Korea. I'd go to Taiwan. I'd make my mark. I play there for three years. I, I build a record and then I'd return triumphant to the United States and let the major league teams bid on me and pay the fees. Uh, the other thing that we see going on a lot right now is how stadiums are being used. What different ballparks are saying, if we can't have baseball, but our state is reopening. I'm doing this from Michigan. Michigan is reopening right now. I just made a haircut appointment. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm pretty psyched about this. But if there's no minor league baseball for the minor league baseball teams in the state, there are ballparks that can be used. And this is the same case for a number of other states. So Kevin, you're watching to see how all these different facilities are being utilized. Yeah, the big thing now is eating, eating uh, at a table in the infield at home plate. 
you know, a number of teams have done that. Um, Pawtucket did and got a, a huge response. I think eating at the ballpark has its charms for the first two or three times you do it. And then you realize there's really nothing special about sitting on a table next to, uh, next to the pitcher's mound. So I think, I think the question is these promotions are great. They keep everyone interested in baseball. They show off the ballpark experience. But I think the, what, what a lot of people are questioning is how sustainable they are. And uh, for some owners, in fact, some owners are kind of rejecting them because they don't want to compete with local restaurants. Because in the long run, the local restaurants are their advertising and, and catering partners. So at a time when every restaurant is struggling, if you're an owner, that's the question you got to ask. Do you want to be competing with another, uh, another local restaurant? And some are just saying no. So it's sort of a mix. I mean, Pawtucket's in the middle of this industrial area. So, you know, you're not, there are not too many places to stroll around the ballpark to hit as far as local restaurants go. But other cities that are downtown, especially, are sort of, you know, a little worried about it. The other thing teams are doing, which I, which I think is sustainable because you can't do them every night, is fireworks. Now, Jesse, is your, is your ballpark doing fireworks? We are planning on having some fire. We haven't announced anything, but there are plans in the works. You know, Omaha did that like the first week of the season and, and did their regularly scheduled fireworks, and they had thousands of people come into the ballpark, staying in their cars and watching the fireworks. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a thing where you can still reward your sponsors. Um, you can uh, keep your, your name high in the, in the business community and the local fan community. And it's sustainable because you're not going to do fireworks every night. Do you know what we actually have to wait for? I believe just as things shake out is, so Lansing, like so many other cities, is having Black Lives Matter rallies and protests. And so as a stadium located right downtown, it's, it's really about giving space as the mayor is meeting with the protesters, as the city is getting everything together. Um, this is not the time for people to be hearing strange explosions going off at night. No, that's, that's certainly an issue. <laughs> For, for some of these downtown ballparks. Um, what, what I find interesting is how these, the, the protests really have not, not touched the baseball world so much, or even the, 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 arena, the venue world in general in terms of sports. Um, there was a rally at Wrigley Field um, the other day. I don't, there was no damage. It was very peaceful. Uh, the Giants had boarded up Oracle Park in worries that there would be protests reaching into that area, but no, nothing happened. Um, there's, there's been no widespread talk about, about, you know, anyone storming a ballpark, which, you know, given, and, and here in Madison, uh, the ballpark is way on the edge of town. So no one's gonna head out, head out there to storm anything. But uh, I, I, I think that the baseball world has been kind of lucky in that it's been spared some, some heavy duty uh, damage. Nick, you've been quiet, which I'm not used to. Let's go all the way back. <laughs> Would you want to eat dinner at home plate? Well, I mean, I've eaten dinner at home plate before. Um, I mean, like, you know, it's, you're around the game long enough. Like you've, you've been there and maybe a, you know, like a sponsor has some kind of a uh, event and you, you know, and they, and they'll, get the ballpark as part of their uh you know their event and and they'll have like you know dinner on the diamond or something like that but you know the Smokies started their own um high school uh summer league you yeah. know because the high school league got canceled so they they've got games that just started this week you know and I mean I don't know if they're going to get more than you know five or six hundred people a game but at least it's something in the stadium and, and some baseball fans can come watch high school, uh, which really isn't a great level to watch there, you know what I mean? But, but it's, it's still something, you know, and, and I, I credit those guys for just looking outside of the box to try to find something because we're not going to have minor league baseball this year. Just not, it's just not going to happen. You know, there's no priority from, from MLB. They, they're having a tough time figuring out, how much the players should get paid. And I, I mean, I'm not even as uh, optimistic as you anymore, Kevin. I, I don't even know if we're going to have baseball. I, I hope you're right because I'd love to have it. But I just, every day that goes by and you're saying, well, now 
we don't, you know, we can't get it in before the 4th of July. And then you're like, well, 50 game season, you know, that seems like, God, that seems so small to me, you know, 50 games. I mean, it's like a college season be better than nothing. But every day that goes by, it's like there's a less likelihood that the union and the players are going to get on the same page. And it, it just feels like there's this animosity between those two that, that has, hasn't been this heightened since the strike of 94, you know. So I hope I'm wrong, but that's just the sense that I get from talking to people and, you know, just my own gut. Um, I, I'm not too far from Pensacola where I'm at right now. I saw that you could go on Airbnb and, and, <laughs> and go hang out at their ballpark. You know, that's a, that's a way to make some money. But th there's no way they're going to be able to overcome the amount of cash that they make on a big weekend. You know, you probably make $60,000 in your concessions, you know. And I know you have a lot of overhead. You're paying all this stuff. But um, it's just a bad spot to be in right now for this game, the fact that we're not playing. And I, and I guess we've had people ha who have come out and said, hey, we're not having a minor league season. But we really don't have any official word yet that it's canceled. We just know it's canceled. There's just we just know because there is not one person talking about minor league baseball starting back up. You know, just talking about the minors, right? And then MLB's having so many issues. Um, and and my hope is that it doesn't spill into next year when they have to renegotiate their contract. You know, so I mean, there's it, there's, it would be great if you felt like. Baseball was at the same point as hockey or the NBA or even the NFL uh, where – and college football too, right, where they're like, hey, look, we're playing. Um, I, I just – the, the – um, you know, everything that you hear kind of it, – it, it's never really positive. It's like, well, this is what they're thinking. You know, we're going to add, like, more teams to the playoffs. But you said it, Kevin, before we were even on the air. It's like the money comes from them being able to get to the playoffs. That's where the television money is. And you're right. I mean, without the fans in the stands, then, then there's a big chunk of revenue, which Tom Ricketts said is 70% of the money the Cubs make. I mean, think about that, 70%, you know. So um, we'll see what happens. I, I Have I eaten dinner at home play? Yeah, but oh, I, we're that, that's such a – here. Are you guys losing me? It's we just a small him, part of what we're doing. can't hear him. Okay, sorry, guys. Let me move this camera. <laughs> Kevin, your thoughts on what Mick's talking about? So we have a little technical issue, it looks like. Um, can you hear me, Jesse? I can hear everyone. I can hear everyone perfectly. Oh. Mick was cutting me out. Me too. Good, all right, good. Uh, what Mick was saying was absolutely right about the, the finances of the playoffs. The playoffs drive, drive the revenue, and there's no way you can make up for that uh, in, in any way. And expanding the teams is great. Um, and, but pushing the playoffs back into Thanksgiving is, and early December is such a, a terrible, terrible move. Um, so I wish the players would sort of back off that. Um, and, and going back to what you said, Mick, about, about optimism versus not being optimistic, it changes every day for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm more optimistic now than I was two days ago. Tomorrow, Good. maybe I'll be, you know, <laughs> oh, there won't be a season and this will just suck. So, <laughs> Mick, deeper question for you. In 1994, the baseball strike, a lot of casual baseball fans, baseball fans of a certain level, got chased away. And however many among those came back with Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Cal Ripken Jr. How is this changing your relationship if you love the game this much, but here's what's going on with the sport? How do you reconcile it? Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like when I'm on your show, you know, it's like I'm kind of trying to blow the whistle here. You know, I'm like the canary, and I'm, I'm constantly saying, look, you know, where baseball is right now is, to me, Outside of the fact that baseball went years without allowing everyone to play based on the color of their skin, which was just, I mean, awful, right? I think baseball right now, you take that away, is in the midst of some of the worst things that it's ever been involved in. You know, like when you have the World Series teams that have cheated to win and, and no one gets punished, 
when you change the baseball and then tell people you didn't change the baseball, but you know, it's obvious that the baseball got changed and the stats are starting to get messed up. Uh, you know, when you eliminate minor league teams and you're kind of sly about doing that. And then now this, you know, where, the, where it's like the players in the ownership, uh, really the players in the commissioner's office can't get on the same page to play when all of us are out of work and we're just going, Hey, you know what? It would be great to have the, the pastime back. And you guys, you know, and you and you go on Twitter and you look at, you know, some of your favorite players on their yachts and swimming in their big in-ground pools and living life just like, you know, no big deal. And 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 a lot of people were going hungry, you know, and and without jobs and stuff and getting furloughed. And and and, and you're bickering over millions of dollars, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, I get it. Like I understand it's a business, right? And I understand that you, both sides feel like they're right. I mean, if I'm the owners, do, am I going to want to take a loss because the players don't want to take a pay cut? No. If I'm the players, do I want to get into another contract where I just got I just got my butt whooped in the last contract negotiation? Now they want me to take, you know, not pay me the money that's in my contract? No. I mean, look, you got to work that out. But to go back to your point, where we're sitting is – we're not trying to put the blame on one side or the other. We're saying, Hey, if you guys can't figure this out, you're going to put the game in a spot where there's a lot of other options. And if there's one thing that we've learned through this whole pandemic deal is that you can still get up in the morning. The sun's going to drop, you know, it's going to rise. If you don't have any sports to watch on television, and if you can't go to a game and watch a sport, you know, so um, it would be great for all of us that make our money with baseball if you felt like the priority was playing the games and doing the fans right first and then the money was second you know so I guess that you know my biggest concern is, is is just I know personally where I stand on this but I also see both sides of it too you know because I've been around this game for a long time I got friends on both sides um in a negotiation you know you have to give and you have to take and it just doesn't feel to me like baseball it has gotten to that point yet. And the longer that this thing goes on, every single day that passes, the likelihood of us having a season gets smaller and smaller. You know, if that's 50 games or not, you know. And we're, we're going to have it by the 4th of July. Kevin, you're right. We can't play the game in November. I mean, we don't even know if there's going to be a second wave of this or not. I mean, that's, there's a rumor about that. They're, they're, you know, the owners are banking on the money they get from playoff TV revenue, right, to be able to pay these guys. You know, whether they like it or not, the players, um, your salary is based on people buying stuff, you know, tickets and advertising and, you know, and, and, and beer and everything else that goes along with, um, you know, with, with playing. And that's not happening right now. So, um, you know, my hope for the game – is that they're able to work this out because I think that we kind of got off light in 94 because of Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire and their home run chase. And don't forget Kyle Ripken and, and his streak. You know, we don't have any of that right now. The biggest player in the game of baseball is Mike Trout. And for some reason, he just doesn't have the personality to capture everyone's attention. And I've heard people say, well, it's because he's in Anaheim, da, da, da. Listen, I'm from Baltimore. Reggie Jackson was my favorite player. He played for the Angels, okay, when I was a kid. I remember watching Reggie. I remember following Reggie, reading about Reggie. I found Reggie in Anaheim. You know, Mike just doesn't have Reggie's personality. I think he might be a better player. <laughs> but, I mean, they're both two of the greatest ever. But for, for whatever reason it is, baseball doesn't have that Cal Ripken, Derek Jeter type of player right now who is not only great on the field, but also captures everyone's imagination. So they're taking a big, big risk. Yeah. I think you left out a couple of things, right? You left out the service time manipulation with like a Chris Bryant or other players. Right. Uh, baseball has given itself black eyes. And yeah. I think one of the most important things that a sport can do, specifically a sport that I love, is you need to try to create new fans instead of chase your fans away. When minor league teams disappear, 
you mm -hmm. lose potential baseball fans in those cities. What was so great about TBS and WGN back in the day was wherever you lived, you could become a Braves fan or you could become a Cubs fan. Yeah. And so that whole idea is what is the outreach right now? Mike Trout is great in terms of talent. His talent is enormous, but baseball also has a lot of other players who it's easy to get behind. It's really easy to root for Max Scherzer. It's really easy to root for Juan Soto. Or it's, the Nationals had stars. They had Bryce Harper, yeah. he left, and they had more guys. And there are more players on different teams. The New York Yankees have some young stars who it's easy to like. Mookie Betts is really easy to like. And so I really do say, okay, <laughs> creating young fans, the outreach for young fans is so important, but that's not the headline with what's going on with Major League Baseball. No, and I, I think I think the the future stars sort of been been pushed aside. I mean, you saw some of them come through Lansing. The Blue Jays have some really interesting players coming up, and quite possibly some some really superstars who could be the face of a game. Yeah, I think yeah. Bo Bichette is a face of the game. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people are going to get behind him as he goes on. Yep, I think you're right, and I think those sort of players need to be highlighted. Um, but you don't see major league major league baseball is a really weird dichotomy with player pushing players versus pushing teams and pushing experiences. And, you know, compared to basketball, uh, it, it's really bad. You know, most people can name more stars off the Minnesota Timberwolves than they can off the Minnesota twins. Well, football, Patrick Mahomes is an immediate superstar. Lamar yeah. Jackson just from last year became a superstar and right on down. And Rob Manford blaming Mike Trout for, for not being a superstar. No, you know, it's, it's not the player who puts himself on that platform. He goes out, he excels, and then you do the work. Exactly. It's, it's a fascinating thing. And because baseball is profitable, baseball is making money. So there really isn't that warning light going off saying, hey, you need to do more. Yeah. So, so who else would be a superstar tomorrow that you guys have seen? And you've seen a lot of guys come up through the systems. I mean, do you want to go team by team? I think well, just, just in general. Dodgers. I mean, you mentioned Bo Bichette, yeah. which, I think, which I found interesting. I think Cody Bellinger with the Dodgers is absolutely ready to step up and take it. I think Gleyber Torres with the Yankees is something else. Yeah. yeah. But do the Cubs have anyone, anyone really notable coming up through the system right now? No. Well, Nico Horner, but I, I think he's a great player, but I, I don't know that he's kind of a transcendent superstar. I mean, look, they have him already. Chris Bryant and Javi Baez are the two best players I, I can remember seeing on a day-to-day -day basis in my time in the minor leagues. Javi's as electric as any player I've ever watched. I mean – I can remember telling people, hey, look, I grew up, I was a big Reggie Jackson fan. Javi's got a lot of that Reggie in him, you know, like you got to watch the strikeouts just as much as you got to watch the home runs. And then, and then KB's like a young, you know, Cal Ripken, although he's not as young anymore, right? Um, and, and, you know, they've already won a World Series. Um, and, and they are big time stars. Um, but, but as far as like the next wave of guys. I mean, I just don't see that, you know, right now with them. And honestly, I don't remember seeing a lot of guys in the entire Southern league that I thought, okay, you know, when I saw uh, Paul Goldschmidt, I remember uh, Wayne Randazzo, who, by the way, I got to throw a shout out to Wayne. Wayne and I are going to be on this um, M this bot baseball. We're going to do play by play for the Cubs Mets on the 18th. So this is a, you know, we haven't announced that yet. So they asked us to do it for charity. It's like, have you heard of that? The bot ball thing? It's like the, it's like um, baseball that these guys, these, this MIT kids, they, they built like a, a, uh, a, a regular season and it's all like uh, computer generated, but it looks real. So we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to bring play by play for one of those games. Jesse, you should definitely do that. That's um, sweet. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's a, you know, so we're going to do that, but, but, I mean, like, when you look around the, the game right now, um, and, 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 I, and I'm just talking about the Southern League, I saw Paul Goldschmidt, I'm like, hey, this guy's a star. You know, and some of the other guys that have come through, I don't, I don't remember anyone in the last few years 
that I've, I've, I've had to like, okay, yeah, this guy, I mean, like th this is the next guy, at least that being in the Southern league, you know, and, and I worry about the game because of the slot at draft, which is another thing I put in there with all the other things I don't like. Um, be, because I, we were not able to go buy those great players from other sports anymore. You know, the Arizona uh, Cardinals quarterback was drafted in the first round by the A's. You know, back in the day, you would just pay him so much money. It's like you, you would just steal him away from football. Uh, but, you know, Kyler Murray now is the quarterback of the Cardinals. You know, the money was probably better in football, which is crazy. So like that, I he wonder, could immediately go in and be a starter in the league. Whereas with baseball, he wasn't going to start for the A's next year. Mm -mm. No, no. But you, what you used to do is you just pay him so much money that it didn't matter. You know, I mean, I, I look, John Elway didn't want to play baseball. He did it just to, to not have to play for the Colts. We know that. And that was like what led the Colts to leave town in Baltimore. But uh, so I guess we'll see what happens. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. As far as the Southern League, there's no one that really sticks out to me in the last couple of years that I'm saying, hey, this guy is going to come in and change baseball, the face of baseball. I think that the Astros getting caught in the cheating scandal hurts because they've got guys. Altuve and Bregman and George Springer are all guys to market your game around. Ronald Acuna with the Braves is a guy to market yeah. around. I do not think that baseball is lacking. Let's, let's hope the folks at made Major League Baseball agree with that. Yeah. You know, they, they, they have not managed to promote players very well overall. Yeah. It's, with the bot that you're talking about, Mick, we're doing out-of-the-park baseball. There are all sorts of other simulations. That there are the substitutes, but then there's baseball. There's yeah. baseball, baseball. And there really just isn't a substitute for whether it's us being there at the field and hearing the snap of the ball into the glove. Uh, I think baseball is a sport where you just have to feel it. And that feeling that I would get every single year, the very first spring training game that I would see, that baseball is back. And it's just, who knows? Uh, although maybe this makes me a hypocrite in terms of I'm following all the different business of the game and the negotiations and everything mm -hmm. like that. And yet I could not be more excited for the draft. I'm just really ready to see where all the young prospects go. I'm ready to see which team gets which player and who I might be seeing in a minor league ballpark next year. What do you think about five rounds of draft? I think it's way too small. And from the people that I've talked to, they're really concerned that it's going to cause an immense log jam next year, that all the players who are going to be forced to go to school will then be put into the, the draft eligibles next year with all the guys who would now rise up and it will just be a mess. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, and, and what's going to happen with college baseball? I mean, think if you're a high school senior and you're going to play college baseball, there's going to be players there that would have left for the draft. Do those guys that were seniors this year, get a chance to come back and play another year because their senior year got cut in half? Like, did, 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 so. did the NCAA decide how they were going to do that with, with spring sports? The I mean, I, I thought they might let them come back, right? They are. Well, the, the NCAA does not have a rule against it. It's up to the individual schools. Some individual schools have said, nah, you're not coming back. We're, we, we can't save your, your quarter scholarship money for you and we're just going to treat it as your eligibility is done now period and i think that's across the board uh if the school's doing it for baseball they're doing it for for other spring sports as well right and, yeah and think about that too. right think about that yeah let's say you're going to lsu you're a big time high school prospect and you don't get drafted in the first five rounds so you say i'm not taking twenty thousand dollars i'm going but the guy that you were going to replace at LSU wasn't drafted in the first five rounds. He was a junior. So he's coming right back for his senior year. And there's no spot for you now. Yeah. You know Think about how good baseball is, is going to be. You, you know who the big winner of this is going to be? It's going to be the junior colleges. Yes. You go play for a year, Juco, and see what happens. Yeah. You know, just like the young high school basketball players who are going overseas, those high school players or whomever it might be can say, let me go to Japan, just like you were saying, Kevin. Let me see yeah. if I can go, impress some people. 
because the money that you would get getting signed out of Japan is so much more than the money you would get getting signed out of America. And generally, you're going to get more than 20 grand to go play in Japan. Jesse, if baseball decides that they're not coming back, you and me and Kevin as our agent, we should go over to Japan and, and broadcast the games back to America and England. I am surprised no one's doing that in this day and age. You don't even need to go there. You can, you can play an MLB and just call them out of the press no. box somewhere, out of a we studio. We have to go. We have to go over there. <laughs> we just to live the culture. I mean, like, how, how awesome would that be? <laughs> about that, about the Major League Baseball broadcasters who were told for road games, expect not to travel. Yeah. yeah. This has been done for years in the Olympics, where I've got a great friend who has called figure skating from the studio in Bristol, or the World Cup. They've had people sitting in the studio and calling the World Cup games from the monitor. Mick, have you ever called a game off a monitor before? Yeah, I've done soccer for the SEC network um, from the football stadium uh, studios. Yeah, it's not a lot of fun. It's really hard to do. You just because you never really get a feel for the game. Now, I'm going to call the this botball game on Thursday from you know wherever I'm sitting that that out here somewhere, and I'm I'm curious to see how that goes. I think it's so hard to match the energy. I've heard broadcasters yeah. calling off a monitor, and either they're way too excited and they burn out or they're not excited enough there's just something of being there where you let the crowd boost you up and you know exactly the kind of energy level to give it and then fall away and let the crowd noise take over well we'll see who's a real storyteller or not won't we because if, you, if you're not a storyteller you can't call from a studio yes but kevin i think it's a learned skill yes. I, I think that that's not something innate so i i would not penalize broadcasters for being bad at it right away. It's going to no. take people time. Yeah, I totally agree. It, uh, I can't imagine not being there and, and calling the action. I, I feel really sorry for any broadcaster that's got to call it from a studio. And yet, the broadcasting industry is changing, and we just have to adapt right along with it. Absolutely. I'm afraid that – sorry, Kevin. I'm afraid that they're going to get through this, this thing, and we're going to do it in the studio – and, and, and some of these teams are going to say, you know what, we should do all of our games that way. We can save money. These guys don't have to travel, blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, and then that becomes the way that it's done. That, that's been my fear going into, you know, when I was first told that that was a possibility to where we are right now. That strikes me as a cycle. And I think that we're seeing it in minor league baseball, where major league teams don't understand why you would have so many minor league affiliates, don't understand why you would have so many players in your system, and they're going right back to the old days. But a major league team would be concerned about the major league team. Maybe you'd have some guys here or there, but you think about your guys. And then it was Branch Rickey, and then the people who patterned things off of him who said, maybe we really need to worry about the guys that we're bringing up to help provide us some depth. Well, broadcasters didn't travel. And if you went back even before that, how many owners said, we don't want a broadcaster because maybe that'll chase people away from buying tickets when they can just sit at home and listen and watch. So broadcasters are bad for home games. And for road games, why should we pay for their travel if they can sit in the studio? It's just sending us right back to the 1930s and 1940s. Yeah. You, you know, interestingly enough, the team, the team that, that set a model for this that, that never was adopted was the Cubs because they had, they had five radio stations, five or six broadcasting Cubs games at Wrigley Field. You know, that's where, that's where you know, the famous broadcasters of the era all came from. And the Cubs were a dynamo in attendance in the 20s and 30s. They outdrew the Yankees. They were the biggest economic force in baseball at the time. And yet very few teams wanted any broadcasting, much less five radio stations. And William Wrigley's attitude was, I'm in, I'm in everyone's home. I'm getting free advertising out of this. Let yes. as many radio, let MA, MAQ wants to come in, great. WBBM, come on in. WGN, come on in. And uh, Bill Beck's, you know, senior was the man who oversaw that. And right now, baseball could use that sort of exposure. Well, that brings yeah. me right back to the outreach part. 
you want to create baseball fans, you bring the baseball to them. My very first team that I worked for was the Brockton Rocks, Brockton, Massachusetts. We had two different flagship radio stations and two different number one broadcasters. We had the broadcast that went out to the entire Brockton Easton area. And then we had a broadcast that went out to the entire Quincy area. So that way they could really cover things. We had separate broadcasts, separate streams, just to try to reach out to as many people as possible. Instead of having different affiliates all carrying the same stream, they could, the broadcasters would reach out. And so our Quincy broadcaster, Matt Miola, would sell locally to all of the different listening areas that he could get to. And then they'd sell locally in the Brockton area. It just made sense. You stayed local within the community and you brought the baseball to them. You know, that's crazy. If baseball were smart, they'd do with the, what, what happened in college football last year and what I think is going to happen with the NBA, where we have multiple streams of broadcasts going on for the same event. So you, you would have a stats geek broadcast. You would have a homer, a real homer. I mean, not just subtle, an out-and-out homer for each side. You could have another, uh, another one with some other angle of the game. Uh, you know, NBA, that's what they're talking about right now for their closed Disney season. And if MLB was smart, they'd work with ESPN and that sort of plan. I mean, that's something that, heck, Mick and I, in knowing the game and calling the game, there's just a feeling of what is expected of us. You as a broadcaster are told, here's how you have to call the game and be fair. And by being fair, I mean something like, don't criticize the official score. Don't criticize the umpire. Don't second guess the manager. If you put an alternate stream where you could criticize the umpire, criticize the official score, (laughs) and first, second, third guess the manager all the live long day, you would have an absolute audience for that broadcast. Well, that would be the Hawk Harrelson channel, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot of fun. Uh, although in this day and age, you know, people do get offended uh, relatively quickly. And not try to be fair, you know, but a couple things that you said, you know, like one of the – my favorite uh, music group is the Grateful Dead, right? You know, and, and the way that they became popular was by allowing people to just come in and record their concerts. You know, they – what what I – and I try to model myself as a broadcaster the same way that, you know, Jerry Garcia was as a musician, you know, like I, I do what I think is good, you know, like I appreciate the art um, and I'm not trying to copy someone else, you know, I'm just trying to be myself. And, and, and maybe that hurts sometimes as you try to ascend uh, the ranks of broadcasting, because, you know, some of the guys that I've watched, like, you know, blow right past me or just carbon copies of someone else you know and that's that's kind of what they're doing you know they're just trying to be what espn or fox or whoever wants wants them to be which is someone that they you know that that fits this mold you know but i think that over the long term you know just like jerry garcia you look back and 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 the that individualism and the art that that he brings to the table like a lot of the old time broadcasters in our business will hold up. You can go back and listen to those guys from years ago and they're still fantastic. You know, Vince Gulley being the last one, right. But you know, Ernie Harwell and uh, Jack Buck and Chuck Thompson and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you just go through, you know, uh, Jerry Coleman because they were all themselves and, and, and they kind of took, took the art part of it um, and, and, and ran with it. But I, I got to say one other thing and, and you just put, this has got to go in my book. I would have never wrote this if you had not talked about the Cubs having all these broadcasts. My first year with the Smokies, we have this guy, Kevin Hardy, not the, not the, you know, the actor, comedian, but the pitcher. And his, and, and his dad, uh, his grandfather grew up in Iowa. And he's, he sends me this email. I mean, this is when email like first came out. I know, you know, and I get this email from, from, from Dick Gregory was his, was his name. And he's like, you remind me of Dutch Reagan. I listened to Cubs games back when I was a kid, and you remind me of Dutch Reagan. I'm like, Dutch Reagan? He's talking about Ronald Reagan. Yeah. He grew up listening to Ronald Reagan. Like the, the, and then so I did some research, and I'm like, wow, I didn't even realize this. Ronald Reagan was the, in Iowa doing Cubs games. He goes to Hollywood because the Cubs are playing the Dodgers, and it becomes like a, you know, like a star. You know, he goes from, from broadcasting uh, – baseball to the to the movies jesse maybe that's something for us to think about but uh you know like it 
the today's day and age, like it's it's especially with baseball. I feel like we're, we've we've like put we boxed it in so much that we forget about the whole concept of what the Grateful Dead did. Is like, hey, take what you want because we're getting our we're we're getting our music and our art out there at the end of the day, you know. And and with baseball, it's like, you know, they 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 sell the rights to the highlights, you know. You're, so you're not supposed to play those, you know, there's like one broadcast and if you don't pay the fee, you know, you can't listen to it if it's not in your market. Um, and that's it. You know, it's all about the money. Did you say that Kevin Hart's grandfather was Dick Gregory? Yeah, that was his name. <laughs> not Dick not Gregory the Dick was, Gregory, I assume. Yeah, he was another, that's another name of a great comedian. That's an amazing coincidence. Is it? <laughs> yeah. But Nick, you and I, as we travel, we see Major League Baseball fans in states and cities that do not have Major League Baseball teams. And I would argue that's a reason why, that Iowa had Dutch Reagan calling the games. So in Iowa, they were creating Chicago Cubs fans. Yeah, and they're still there. And, and, and you brought up something else too, like when the Cubs and the Braves were on, you know, I, I'm in New Jersey as a kid, you know, move out of Baltimore, move to New Jersey. No Orioles and no way to listen to them back then. And here's Harry Carey and Steve Stone on, on WGN. And, 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 I mean, I've been a Cubs fan ever since. Yeah. I mean, I've never even been anywhere near Chicago at that point. But I'm watching every day. And all of a sudden now I'm paying attention. Everything Chicago. You know, I get my first Cubs hat, my jacket, you know, my, my jersey. Like, and uh, they become my favorite team. And it was a team I never went to see play, but I saw them every single day on television. And I felt like I was part of, of the, of the Cubs fan base. And I, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's the same thing with the Braves. It was the same way. Remember when the Braves stunk and then all of a sudden they start climbing and going to get better. There were Braves fans everywhere because of the superstation. Yeah. I mean, I was a bandwagon for whatever sport, Chicago Bulls fan growing up yeah. because the Bulls games would be on. And so how could I not love Jordan and Pippen? And right on down, I decided the Detroit Tigers were my team because I was able somehow to listen to, to hear the Tigers, to see their box scores. And I decided that that was my team. And that whole discussion of creating new fans. All right, our baseball thesaurus term of the day and term of the week. Last week, we talked about the pitcher's rubber. This week, we're going to talk about the pitcher's mound. Any other terms for a pitcher's mound that you two want to throw out there? Give us the hill. Give, give us the hill. The bump. Oh. Yeah. Right? The pitcher's on the bump. The guy's on the yeah. bump today. It's the mound, the hill, the incline, the knoll, the mountain, the summit, any of those different things, the crest, the firing line. As I was <laughs> working on the third edition, I got together with my groundskeeper here with the Lansing Lugnuts, really great groundskeeper. And I said, just break down this entire structure for me. And so the pitcher's mound is separated into several different things, all right? So the tabletop is the flat of the mound. You've got the dirt passage that some teams have, let's say in Detroit or in Arizona, that's the pitcher's path, that's the runway, or that's known as the keyhole. You have the bump is the specifically the peak of the mound, and then you've got the slope. So the slope, then you've got the bump, and around the back, that's the horseshoe. If you're a groundskeeper, those are, that's what comprises the mound. Think about the eye, the iris, the pupil, etc. Horseshoe, bump, slope. Well, on the pitcher's mound back in the day was a maximum of 15 inches, but there really wasn't a minimum. So depending upon which pitcher you were, you could request for your groundskeeper to make it higher or lower that day. So Bob Feller wanted it as high as possible so he could come right downhill. Other pitchers liked it to be nice and flat. Or the groundskeeper would screw with whatever pitcher was coming in from the other team and he'd put it higher or lower just to make sure that guy was uncomfortable. All the way up until they finally standardized it in 1950. And then we were talking about this. They changed the mounds and this led to the year of the pitcher, 1968, and Bob Gibson buzzsawing right through Walter Johnson's 1-1-4 ERA, and posting a 1-1-2 ERA, and then they had to change the mound because of that. So the pitcher's mound and all the different ways that it changes the game, 
you, if you go way back, way back, and I wrote about this in the Baseball Thesaurus, at the turn of the 20th century, Cleveland had a batter's box that stood almost a foot taller than the pitcher's box. Can you even imagine? You, you know, you go to some of those old ballparks and hear about them, and you, you hear about the bows in the field and the different, by accident, this, this probably was done on purpose to give the batters a, a big edge there. Oh, yeah. If you were able to favor your pitcher or favor your hitter, right, of all the different things that a groundskeeper could do, you could make a ridge up the foul line. That way your bunters could bunt it staying fair. Or if the other mm -hmm. team had good bunters, it would ridge foul. You would grow the grass higher or lower. Those different ways that a groundskeeper can manipulate a game just a little bit. Yeah, water the infield too. You know, like if you want to slow the ball down, you got fast runners. You, you know, you you water the infield, or you got good ball runners. Or how about going back to you know the the the, the, the John McGraw Orioles? You know, you never watered that infield because you want you know hit the ball down on the ground and pop it in the air, and then the little speed guys would get the first. Baltimore chop. Baltimore chop. There you go. I heard too that they grew the grass high in the outfield, high enough so that the outfielders could hide a spare baseball. Let's say somebody <laughs> hit a ball over the outfielder's head, he could just reach down and check the baseball back into the infield. How about that? I've never heard that before. That's hilarious. Yeah. So there you go. Today, great book. The pitcher's mound. When we talk about the man on the mound or the man on the hill. Uh, all the different things that have led to that being the mat. And when we talk about on the bump, as broadcasters so often do, right? Mickey would say, tomorrow, here's who's going to be on the bump for the Tennessee Smokies. Yeah. The very yep. rest of that mound. Yeah. All right. And with that, shall we wrap up another Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat? Great. Yes. What a great talk today. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah. Big thanks to Mick Gillespie. To Kevin Reichardt, I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. Check in ballparkdigest.com. This has been another Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat. Until next week.